next let's talk about the legalist thinkers, Shang Yang. It is in the 4th and 3rd century BCE that we see the full emergence of the theory of legalism. Shang Yang, Shen Bu Hai, Shen Dao, and Han Fei Zi are among the leading legalist thinkers. Han Fei Zi is the grand synthesizer of the legalist thought. He treats Shang Yang, Shen Bu Hai, and Shen Dao as his theoretical predecessors. He presents them as the representatives of three major strands of the overall synthesis. Shang Yang was an aristocrat from the old small state of Wei. This is not Wei, the successor state of Jin. He seeks his fortune in the rising state of Wei, the successor state of Jin. In there, he comes under the influence of the circle of Wu Qi and Li Kui. His talents are not appreciated by the ruler of Wei. He soon seizes the opportunity to become the advisor of the ruler of the state of Qin. Qin is a remote frontier state. In the state of Qin, only the upper class has been affected by Chinese civilization. The ordinary people still live in conditions of simplicity and touched by either the higher values or the corruptions of civilization. It is this state of affairs that make it possible for Shang Yang to apply his program with such success. The Book of Lord Shang is not wholly the work of Shang Yang, it is probably put together by later disciples. However, the clarity of its style seems to convey the spirit of one strong personality. He feels no need to provide his program with a cosmological and ontological foundation. His goals are clear. He knows how to achieve them. He will turn the state of Qin into the wealthiest and the most powerful state of the Chinese world. Lord Shang is the theorist of Fa. Shen Bu Hai is the theorist of Shu, bureaucratic method or technique. Shen Dao is the theorist of Shi, authority. What Fa means is not a mere concern with penal law as the instrument of social control. When Lord Shang speaks in chapter 1 of changing the Fa, he seems to be speaking of a total program of social institutional change. In fact, Penal law and system of positive incentives both play a crucial role in the entire program. The main emphasis of the program is on agriculture and war. Quote, that by which a state is advanced is agriculture and war. End quote. Agriculture is the true source of wealth. Wealth will satisfy the basic economic needs of the people. But wealth is mainly treated as instrumental to the achievement of state power. Land is to be assigned to peasant households whose revenues will be directly available to the state. Military service is to be encouraged. 
by making the penalties for avoiding service more frightening than the fear of death in battle. Outstanding performance in battle is to be richly rewarded. All useless and dysfunctional activities which divert men from the tasks of agriculture and war are to be eliminated. For instance, commerce, useless crafts, and the cultivation of ancient, erroneous learning, which encourages people to rely on their individual moral values and private intellectual convictions. The penal laws are to be applied universally to all, regardless of rank. The noble families must prove their right to their genealogical claims by their performance on the field of battle. Rank and its accompanying privileges are to be based wholly on merit. Penal law and rewards play a central role in this entire program. The entire program is to be set in motion by reliance on the negative and positive incentives of a universal, objective, and impersonal system of penal laws and rewards. It is this engine of incentives which will move all human energies in the desired directions. It is a program which demands a simple behaviorist model of man based primarily on the elemental responses of pain and pleasure. In a strange echo of Manchin's statement that, quote, human nature is good just as water tends to flow downward, end quote. Lord Shang proclaims that, quote, the tendency of the people to pursue its interest is like the tendency of water to flow downward." Han Feizi asserts that, quote, In ruling the world, one must follow the bent of man's true nature. Man's nature is based on his likes and dislikes. Thus, rewards and penalties can be effectively used, and because rewards and penalties can be effectively used, prohibitions and commands can be implemented, and thus good order can be actualized. The ruler holds the handles in order to establish his authority." End quote. When properly manipulated by those who understand the true science of human behavior, this model of man can be channelized to move the entire society in the desired direction. Those anomalous elements of society whose motives cannot be controlled, such as righteous recluses, who are immune to both the fear of pain and attraction of pleasure are a menace to the entire legalist program. This model of man is necessary to the predictability of the system. Lord Shang stresses severe punishments more than the positive reinforcement of rewards. The legalist program, as he conceives of it, makes harsh demands. Men must be prepared to die in battle or to toil away their lives in agriculture. The natural bent of human beings is towards safety and indolence. Although generous rewards are recommended for performance in battle, although economic inducements are offered for success in production, there remains the fact that men basically hate hard labor and physical danger.
Therefore, the sanctions against indolence and against allowing people to be lured into the secondary occupations, such as commerce, craftsmanship, and useless activities, such as the study of the irrelevant cultural heritage, the vain labor of sophists, cosmologists, diviners, and all other pursuits irrelevant to the goals of state, wealth, and power, must be severe and unrelenting. Positive reinforcements seem to be insufficient to prevent the seductive attraction of all these diversions. If punishments are made severe and implacable for even small infractions of prescribed behavior, the temptation to flout the law on more important matters will disappear. Shangyang and Han Feizi even provide a kind of historic evolutionary framework for their theories. In the beginning, when human beings were few in number, the frictions among them were rare, even though they were essentially the same creatures obedient to the same responses of pain and pleasure as they are now. The first humans were peculiarly helpless organisms. The sages created for them the infrastructures of a tolerable physical existence and the basis of an ordered political hierarchy. Since population was sparse, and food supply plentiful, the early rulers could afford to exercise a lax control. This is the notion of rule by benevolence and righteousness. With the growth in population and the growing scarcity of goods, the struggle for survival gradually has grown in ferocity it has become more and more apparent that it is only by mechanisms of punishments and rewards that people can now be controlled. The methods of Yao, Shun, and Yu may have been quite appropriate in their time, but they are now obsolete. Lord Shang and Han Feizi account for more puzzling and complex byproducts of the rise of civilization. Lord Shang acknowledges that alongside the simple responses of pain and pleasure, with the rise of social hierarchies, there also arose the love of honor. This is a somewhat intangible and complicating gratification. Men seem to be willing to suffer physical hardships in order to attain honors. The enlightened ruler must include the incentives of honor and prestige within his machinery of punishments and rewards. Beyond this, there are all the false and illusory moral, intellectual, and cultural needs, which have been a puzzling byproduct of the rise of civilization. These phenomena are just as puzzling as the false reflective and purpose-oriented consciousness which emerges in Lao Tzu's account of the rise of civilization. Civilization has in fact produced all sorts of anomalous and illusory notions of individual autonomy, such as the Confucian notion that the realization of moral values is the private preserve of individuals. The notion that 
intellectuals can develop their own private theories, that men of the sort can presume to present themselves as private military heroes, arrogating to themselves the right to offer their services, and the notion that some men can make the private decision to opt out of society entirely, rendering themselves completely immune to the motivations which make it possible for the social system to work all of these false notions of individual autonomy are an accountable product of civilization. They must be eliminated if the social political order required by the times is to be realized. These notions may be based on illusion, but they have real dysfunctional consequences. They may not have been particularly harmful in the past. When the struggle for survival was not so fierce, but in the world of the late warring states, they must be eliminated if a truly public behavioral science is to be established. Lord Shang and Han Feizi are thoroughly convinced that the notion of the individual initiation of behavior is entirely incompatible with a true science of social political organization. However, Han Feizi argues that Lord Shang's presentation of the true science is not complete. What Lord Shang provides is a clear vision of the historic goals to be attained. The creation of a state sufficiently wealthy and powerful to achieve a clear hegemony within the anarchy of the Chinese international arena. He provides the basic plan for creating the agricultural and the military organizations which are required. With his integrated system of penal laws and rewards, he provides the engine for effectively channeling the behavior of the people. When Han Feizi refers to Shang Yang as the man of Fa, the word fa refers not simply to his concept of a legal code, but in fact to his whole model of social reorganization.